Thank you very much for the introduction and welcome to this session on embedded system architecture. Maybe we are in the wrong place because this is a conference on software architecture, software architecture gathering. And we are talking about embedded system architecture. Uh, well, uh, we want to show that there is a lot of commonality, but our heart, Wolfgang's and my heart, is really in the embedded world where hardware, software, mechanics, electronics, and everything comes together. On our title slide, I have put a picture of a Swiss police car. You will find soon, you will soon find out why, because if we have Swiss guests among us in the audience here, maybe you will hate Wolfgang and me after that talk. So what we intend to do uh, is we want to show you how we use the ARC42 template that has been mentioned several times in other talks to design and document an embedded hardware and software system. And we have included a picture of the system that we will describe here. Uh, let me first shortly introduce Wolfgang and myself in there. We met more than 30 years ago in a joint project developing a modeling tool uh, over many, many years. 1.3 million lines of C++ code and doing all these graphical models there. Then Wolfgang went a different way. He founded his own company to develop hardware software communication solutions, and he did that with his company for more than 20 years. Over the last years, he discovered his secret uh, uh, profession. He wants to be a trainer and a consultant, and so now he passes on all his knowledge that he acquired during his business life there as a certified trainer for ISAQB and as a consultant for software and hardware systems. We share this talk in a very simple way. Wolfgang did all the work to develop that system, and I will just do the talking. Uh, I am a founding member of ISAQB, but also of the IREP, the Sister Organizations for Requirements Engineers, and I'm also, together with Gernot Starke, the co-founder of ARC42 as a portal of open source uh, template for architecture. And we did the same for requirements with REC42. So uh, let me go in there. And if you haven't seen ARC42, maybe in the uh, talk of Johannes Dienst this lunchtime and so on, let me give you a short overview. It is a very simple primitive container structure, a template, just consisting of 12 chapters there, but it captures the essence of architecture in terms of views. And compared to other uh, systems, we only have three key architectural views, building blocks, runtime, and deployment. Uh, if you know TOGAF, there is 13 or 15 views out there. If you know the Zachman framework, there is maybe 30 views. We try to keep it simple. And we call it support for structured laziness because we have seen so many discussions in companies. How should we document our architecture? And we say, please stop that. We put that for free on the internet uh, many years ago, and you can concentrate on filling in the content instead of fighting on what structure should your documentation have. This template is available in many different formats and in many different languages. You've heard uh, this lunchtime the use of the ASCII doc format in there. I will show you how we have done that in a wiki with graphical modeling tools. In uh, You can have that in German, in English, in Spanish, in Russian, in many different language. And the good news, it's open source and it will forever stay open source. What I want to do today is show you that this template is good for much more than just software architectures. You can capture complete system architectures involving many different technologies, like hardware and software and mechanical parts and electronic parts. And this is what we really love to do develop systems in the automotive industry, develop medical instruments, develop industry automation, factory automation systems, 
And yes, they have a strong part of software in there, but the whole system is much more than the software. My old friend Imtias Pierby said, when was the last time you have seen software walking down the streets without hardware being involved? So the system that we want to deliver is much more than just the software, the system that does some benefit to the market out there. So that's our goals. And let's start at the beginning. Uh, in chapter one of ARC42, we normally do a very short introduction, sort of requirements overview, not more than half a page or one page, because we assume that somebody else has done a good requirements document stored somewhere else. But reading about the architecture, you at least want to know what the system is doing. So let me come to our system. And as I said, maybe our Swiss listeners here will not love us because this product is a traffic pursuit unit and it is mounted in police cars and does speed measuring. The police car drives behind you and measures your speed and records your speed and maybe even does video recording of that and will pass on all these measurements to the legal authorities which will fine you if you've broken some of the rules, some of the traffic rules. Uh, this system can be marketed in, in, a, in the full version or in a low cost variant in there. So if you have ever been caught by such a police car in Switzerland, I think you will not love us for doing that. Uh, an important thing, uh, you have heard multiple times in this conference that architecture decisions are driven by our quality requirements. And so in chapter 1.2, we really summarize the key quality goals for that system. In this case, the top category here was accuracy. The measurements of that system shall be very correct and very precise within a specified deviation range. And I can tell you this system is much better than the stationary radars which you find on the roadside. So it's more precise. It has been checked by the uh, Swiss authorities on that accuracy. So we don't have to give you a lot of tolerance there. The measurement is very, very correct. Of course, second highest goal there is robustness. This system is mounted in police cars. Uh, they are driving. They are driving in every weather condition. They are driving on rough roads in there. And the system has to reliably work under all these environmental conditions. And last but not least, it's used by all police officers. They want a decent interface, an interface that they can easily handle. They don't want to go to a, a training seminar on how to handle that system before that. So what we insist on in ARC42 is that you look at all your quality goals that Michael Plöt has so nicely described in this morning session in there and pick your top level quality goals that will determine the success of the product. All the other qualities, we have chapter 10 and there you can have your full quality trees and you can have all your scenarios in there. We just want to make sure that in the introduction of ARC42, you concentrate on the most important ones uh, and you know them right up front. I will skip the section on constraints number two and concentrate on something else that you also already learned in this uh, conference that is the importance of setting your context. In commercial systems, uh, the business context is normally good enough. It shows your system in the middle. It shows all the adjacent systems and users around it. And it shows the logical inputs and the logical outputs. Very rarely do you need section number 3.2 with the technical context. That's different in our environment of embedded systems. We want to have that technical context, which again shows our system in the middle, but now it shows the physical interfaces, the lines, the cables, the uh, kind of connections to your outside world. And of course, you have to map your logical input, your inputs and outputs to these physical interfaces. So let's be more concrete in our case study you see the traffic pursuit unit TPU in the middle. 
On top, you see police officers as a human user and maybe also the car driver that the police officer followed there because if you have been fined, you get immediately proof. You can look at the video clips. You see the pursuit protocol live uh, while you have been stopped in your car. But there's a lot of technical environment. There is GPS antennas uh, attached to that system. The speedometer, of course, is attached to the system. We have a couple of cameras sending video frames and are controlled by our system. And finally, we have to deliver the pursuit files, the final findings to the police station. So that's the uh, business context diagram showing you all the input and the output. Let's contrast that with the technical context diagram. Here you see all of the DPU hardware in the middle, and it's connected to printers, keyboards, screens. It's connected in various ways to the car. So you're saying GPS signals, it's radio signals coming in. There's digital input from the speedometer. There is digital input from the ignition, the voltage in there. And we also do a mapping of the output channel. This is a DVI interface here to the screen. You see it on the picture over here. And video clips and system information are transferred over that interface. If it's simple as that, we can map that in the, in the diagram immediately. Normally, uh, imagine for a moment if you, how many ways do you have to enter the destination in a navigation system? So you wanna have your, your goal where you wanna go there. Well, you can have as a physical channel, the keyboard, you're typing city and street and house number and so on or you can point with your finger to the screen and saying, this is where I wanna go. Or today you can even talk to your car and tell them. So there's three difficult, different channels on which the same logical information, I wanna go there, is transmitted. So in embedded systems, we put much more emphasis on the technical context diagram, uh, not only on the business context diagram, and we make sure that we match the inputs and outputs to the channels that we have. By the way, just for a little bit of uh, background technology, the whole architecture here is described on a Confluence site and the pictures are all drawn in Enterprise Architect, which is automatically exported and included into the Confluence file. So whenever you change a picture, your Confluence site will be okay and updated. So much for the background. Uh, that we are using in, in terms of tools. Let's go a little bit further. And uh, the next thing that I want to show you is the deployment view, because in embedded systems, the deployment sometimes, or I should say the infrastructure look, sometimes defines your building blocks. Uh, you have heard so many talks where the building block structure is in the middle and you're doing domain-driven decomposition or process decomposition or whatever in there. In our world of embedded systems, it's always the deployment view or very often the deployment view, you already know which hardware elements you will have and that determines the software view. So let me show you the deployment diagram but first of all, let's zoom into that piece of hardware to show you the inside, the many boards that are there in one rack stacked on top of each other. And if you portray that as an infrastructure diagram, as a deployment diagram in UML, the first purpose of that diagram is document your infrastructure. You, hear, you see here there's a measuring unit node containing internal processes. More than that, uh, there is a central PC there is video cards, video subsystem, and there's the power control node. Uh, uh, so inside the measuring unit node, by the way, that's the way it looks like in there. There is a GPS receiver transforming the GPS radio signal into other format before it goes to that board. And there's a keyboard switch that's pure hardware functionality in there. Here is a picture of the video boards and how uh, the video cards and how they look like. Purpose number two of that model is describe the capabilities of your hardware, of your nodes and channels. Here's an example. This board up here 
This is an ARM processor running at 200 MIPS, 180 megahertz, and there's multiple RS-232 lines with a speed of 150 kilobaud. So here's one principle. We always have pictures and text in the back. If you double click an enterprise architect, you get that kind of definition in the background. The deployment view drives the building block view. So that drives my top level decomposition. You have heard about domain-oriented decomposition or functional decomposition or whatever. Let me tell you about hardware-based decomposition. And please note that for the building blocks and for the components, we use the word functional building blocks because it's not yet clear whether the function is implemented in hardware or in software and which part is implemented in which technology. So let's overlay that picture with the software. You see a measuring unit is running on the uh, MU CPU port. The video unit is running on that PC. Power control software is running on the power control node. And there is a video subsystem running on the video cards. Uh, this green stuff is pure hardware functionality. The blue stuff is pure software functionality. And here, we still have a feature-oriented decomposition. We need that feature of a video subsystem, but we have not yet decided whether it's implemented in hardware or in software in both. That's why we've chosen the white color. Uh, the third purpose of the deployment diagram is, of course, mapping the functionality onto the underlying infrastructure onto the hardware. So let's do a little bit of trick and remove the hardware. If we take that diagram and we zoom in the software only, you see the measuring unit, you see the video unit, and now you see their interfaces, how they cooperate on software. Here you see the physical channels, RS-232 and so on. Here you see that this one is offering an interface and the video unit is using that interface, similar to the video subsystem and again, we have software and mixed technology components. Uh, this diagram, the software diagram here is apps or the functional diagram is absolutely consistent with our context diagram that you've seen. So we have the pursuit protocols, we have the video frames coming in, we have the speedometer pulses, everything you have seen in the context diagram so far. Uh, let us zoom in a little bit. We take the video cards, this big uh, hardware here with the video subsystem, and we zoom in and you see on the next level, again, there's three pieces of hardware. There is a hardware codec, there is a user inserter node and a legal inserter node. And again, we have hardware and software running on that. The green stuff is pure hardware functionality. So you see this block here does a lot of functions, but it does it in hardware. This block up here has hardware functionality, which is mainly transporting all these video signals, plus software functionality deployed to it. So this is the hardware codec in there. And if you again take out only the functionality picture, you see a lot of hardware functionality and you see software functionality. In ARC42, we normally insist that every building block has a black box description. So you want to know what this block is doing. And here is a description of that hardware block, the video codec. It models the functionality of the hardware codec. It transforms incoming videos into digital streams and so on, captured by the video unit on the PC board. So that's that interface to the PC board here. Here is a description of that software functionality. Uh, the user inserter inserts text into the videos. So the video is, is flowing through the hardware and this software makes sure that it uses the interface of the hardware to put text in there. And this one then augments the various sources of video frames with this kind of inserted text. That's why it's called a user inserter. By the way, the difference between the legal inserter and the user inserter the user inserter inserts the text in big letters on the screen so that the police officers can read that while driving. The legal inserter keeps the picture clean and makes a small line on the bottom. And this is then sent to the uh, authorities for further proof. So they have to see the picture 
and they want it. So there's different kinds of, of text insertion into these various modules. Okay, uh, let's go one step further. Yeah, you might have heard the talk from Matthias Polen yesterday, who talked about how important naming is. And it's very nice to have that kind of overview models, but please, please, please define your key domain terminology. Uh, the thing that the domain-driven design people call their ubiquitous language. And we have done that, of course, uh, giving some important terms like what is a pursuit step, the measured and calculated data for one second within the pursuit. Pursuit duration, distance, current speed, and current maximum violation. So how far over the top of the allowed speed have you already been going while you have been uh, followed by that police car? We define what's the distance per frame, distance in millimeters during one frame of the, we define the frame interval, smallest period for data sampling in there. We define the video frame and so on. Usually we have 25 frames per second in there. So this is really high speed uh, coverage here. So that's why we have chapter 12. If it's more complex and you wanna do real uh, more complex models in there, we put them into chapter eight as the domain concept. And there we put all the business objects, the domain objects and their relationships and do a thing. If it's only a glossary, it, then it's an alphabetically sorted, no, not always alphabetically sorted. I resorted them for this, uh, for this talk here to, to talk about certain things. So, uh, but we also have the runtime view. You have seen the deployment view and the key message was in embedded systems, the deployment view might drive the building block decomposition on the, on the highest level. We've seen zooming into the hardware and zooming into the software. So why the hell do we still need a third view, a runtime view? And here is four reasons for that. Uh, we use a runtime view in terms of scenarios, very, very concrete examples in order to find missing building blocks. If you go through a sequence of steps and you discover, ooh, who is doing that? We have no building block, no functionality doing that. Well, you discover the building block that's missing. But more often, you only want to extend or modify or change an existing building block. You found something, but in a specific scenario, you're saying, ah, oh, this is uh, a different uh, kind of method. We haven't yet discovered that in the interface. So you're changing interfaces, you're adding new methods maybe to an existing class or an existing package in there. So you, you learn more by discussing very concrete scenarios, thereby improving your deployment structure or your building block structure. The third use for these scenarios, I always say it's wasted time. You run a scenario, you look at your building blocks and your infrastructure, and you check it and everything works fine. This is like a successful test case. Uh, so it would have worked without you writing the scenario or discussing that scenario, but you feel very fine if you don't have to change anything, you didn't miss a building block, you didn't have to change anything else, but mostly it was wasted time. And there's a fourth reason for having such scenarios, which is some people learn more about your architecture if you show them such a dynamic view. If you explain them a very concrete scenario, maybe they don't wanna look at your static structure. They don't want to look at your infrastructure. They don't want to look at your building blocks. They love to discuss dynamic behavior of the system. And it's the only reason for why we put it in the ARC42 documentation. Reason number one, two, and three. Yes, we will do a lot of scenarios, but we will mainly do them on the whiteboard. We will do them uh, on flip charts or whatever, and we'll throw them away because... Uh, one of the notations you can use for runtime view, for instance, is sequence diagrams. 
do you know how quickly outdated sequence diagrams are? And I hate wrong documentation. So if you don't promise me that you will update and keep alive your documentation, you better throw it away and don't store it in your architecture documentation. So keep only as many scenarios in chapter six as you can really promise that you will keep them up to date. There is dozens of, oops, there is dozens of notations, uh, starting with plain text, having a lot of uh, UML diagrams. I didn't mention here non-UML diagrams, but you can, anything you have ever done to do a step, step, step description of your system can be used as a notation for scenarios. And in this talk, I will show you various uh, ways of documenting such a scenario so that you can have a choice. What is your favorite notation? What is your best way to communicate with your stakeholders? And for many stakeholders, this is plain text. And for others, it might be activity diagrams or it might be state charts or whatever in there. So let's pick one scenario from this traffic pursuit unit. Uh, it's called measurement propagation. And let me explain that first in plain text, because then it's very simple to understand. So you receive speedometer pulses at a very high frequency. And then for every frame interval, so for every 40 milliseconds, you do the following. You calculate the distance per frame and you display the bottom line in the legal inserter. And if one second has passed in every full second, then you calculate the distance per second and all the other data for that pursuit step. And you update the display, not only in the legal inserter, but also in the user inserter. So that's a very simple English explanation, but watch for our consistency. We have used defined names, frame interval. You might remember that from glossary, distance per frame, bottom line, and we have used building block names like the legal inserter and the user inserter. So even this text is consistent with the models of our architecture. Well, other people hate English texts and they wanna see that as a simple UML activity diagram. By the way, it's not so simple because we have been using object flow diagrams uh, to show you how old I am, I grew up in the time when data flow diagrams were popular and you had functions resulting in data and the data being input for another function or that function having two inputs and producing one output. You can do that in the UML by putting uh, data between the functions. Uh, but what we carefully do here, we make sure that every function like the format the main info is attached to a building block, which in this case is called UI service pursuit. So for everything, calculate distance per frame is done by the frame taho. And it results in that element in there going over to formatting the bottom line done by the data synchronizer. So this is all names of functional building blocks that we have in there. And this is names of parameters of these functions of the methods going in and out. Oh, some people don't like activity diagrams so much. So why don't we use a communication diagram as introduced in all these pattern-oriented software architecture books from the Siemens folks and, and others in there. And note what we've been doing here in the tool. We used color coding in there and saying the black message on the bottom is the trigger. Number one, the speedometer pulses come in repeatedly. The red message is what, every, what happens every 40 milliseconds. We send the distance per frame to the data synchronizer and the bottom line to the legal inserter. The green messages, all the stuff up here, number three, 3.1, 3.2, 3.4, 5, 6, and so on. This is done every second, every full second. So we are just showing a different notation, a UML communication diagram instead of an activity diagram to portray the same thing. The most popular notation uh, that we're normally seeing is sequence diagrams. And here again, we use some trick that we can do in Enterprise Architect. We've not only shown you the sequence diagram, we have overlaid it with the hardware units. 
So this is the car hardware in your environment, in the context diagram outside, where the real speedometer is sending you the pulses. And every 40 milliseconds, it goes to the measuring unit, which, by the way, this part of the system can be sold separately. If you don't have the PC and you don't have the video units and the cameras in there, you can use the whole system just with a measuring unit and then still get all the recordings, but it will not be displayed so nicely. Uh, but you see every 40 milliseconds is passed on to the video unit and the bottom line is passed on to the legal inserter. And every full second, you're calculating more things and it's passed on to the legal inserter and the user inserter. Since we are having a distributed system here with hardware, different boards, of course, running totally asynchronous, the real communication between all these things is asynchronous. And you can also show that. And that's what we have as a most complex runtime view here an activity diagram with our level one building block swim lanes, the measuring unit, the video unit, and the video subsystem, and showing that asynchronous communication. What you see here is, in fact, four activity diagrams. This first one is the activity running on the measuring unit, and it sends off asynchronous signals like the pursuit data and the frame distance. This second one in green background is the activity diagram of the video unit. It receives those asynchronous signals, does some work in there, and passes on other asynchronous signals to the video subsystem and uh, legal inserter and the user inserter. And here you see the very simple diagrams, what these two subsystems are doing with that. So let's step back for a moment. Whether you prefer the plain English text in order to understand the process. Uh, still having good names and links to the building blocks in there, or you prefer simple sequence diagrams already showing you the functional blocks and uh, the building blocks alignment there, or you want to do it in terms of communication diagrams, or you want to do it a sequence diagram overlaid, or you want to concentrate on that asynchronous behavior all these is scenarios that we put into the chapter on the dynamic view where we have our runtime view. But don't document too much. In this book where we discuss that case study, we have done it for demonstration purposes only so that you can see the same scenario uh, in different modeling notations, all in the same tool. Uh, using a little bit of color code, using a lot of UML, very precise UML to model that, all of that in there so that you can pick. Normally, we would have selected our style in a certain, in a given architecture and not do so many different versions of it. Uh, we have discussed that in embedded systems, very often the deployment view is the starting point in order to drive your component structure, your top level building block structure. And you can verify that cooperation between the building blocks using the runtime view with this dynamic runtime scenarios. There is one more important thing that gets more important from day to day. Uh, and we've put that into ARC 42 uh, in the chapter eight, and this is cross-cutting concepts. Uh, this cross-cutting concepts in there, uh, they simplify the discussion of your component structure and your deployment structure by defining concepts once and forever in chapter eight. There we explain such a cross-cutting concept with very concrete technology steps, with examples, even code examples, rules for implementation. And for our domain, uh, in the commercial domain, this is normally how do you handle persistence? How do you handle internationalization? How do you handle uh, maybe error handling or things like that? In our domain is how do you implement the driver, the interface to the hardware? How do you do event handling there? What's an event broker? And, and you define that once and forever. Or what is socket communication? And once you've defined that as a concept with lots of examples and very concrete technology in Chapter 8, you can use that in the building block view by, for instance, saying building block number five, 
is a driver that uses socket communication. So you see, we're using stereotypes to link these concepts described in chapter eight to the building blocks so that not in every building block, like building block four and building block five, we have to explain how a driver works. We explain that once and we use it in many places. And we say building block three is an event broker. And if you know, want to know how an event broker works, read chapter 8.7 maybe or whatever it is. Read the concept in chapter 8. So these cross-cutting concepts are a real way to simplify your documentation by not duplicating work, by don't repeating yourself. Put that in a central place and use it in your other views. Of course, we've used that in our example. So for instance, we talk about event handling and we have developed a template in Arc 42 how to describe such a concept. And uh, we've stolen that uh, from uh, uh, Stefan Zerner in one of his books. So you always describe the problem statement. In this case, we want to have uh, a lot of components generating events and they should be free of knowledge about these events, how these events are handled. And then we describe a solution for that. We will identify event sources, and the events will be managed by an event broker in a central queue, delivery on a single thread in there. So here's a problem statement. How do we do that? Here's a solution. And as a next step, we will show you that as a generic runtime view. So we're again using a runtime view, uh, how event sources, event brokers, and event handlers work together. So you see any object that acts as an event source, another object acting as an event source, another building block acting as a broker, and so on. Events coming into the broker, and there is the stack built up on how they should be handled, and the broker as a single thread then distributes the event in the sequence that is predefined. And again, in the building block view, uh, this is a diagram you haven't seen before because it's a, a level two diagram of the PC software in there. There is something like the Moo proxy, the measuring unit proxy, which is an event source. You see the stereotype event source. And there's the TPU files, traffic pursuit unit files, and they also are uh, an event source. And here is the broker, and this one behaves like described in chapter 8.7, the broker, and passes on these signals to the various event handlers. So we describe the problem, we describe the solution, and then we maybe very detailed model the behavior, how these sources and brokers work together, and we use them with stereotypes, I am an event source, I am an event broker, and thereby already knowing a lot about that component. Note on the side that we are very pre precise with interfaces, who offers what and who has. So we have very precise interface notations in this example in there. So ah, there was one more thing. And you might have heard the talk this lunchtime from uh, the Deutsche Bahn in there on using Arc42. And they have very nicely shown how to work with architectural decision records with ADRs. So we have a place in Arc42 where we capture those design decisions. Um, that's not the only place where we keep them because the most important design decisions we've already written down in the solution strategy. So your very big design decisions that you have been taking, they are maybe on one page description or two page description at the beginning of our uh, architecture documentation. Some of the other decisions that can be defined locally. So for instance, if you have a deployment unit with a certain purpose, a node with a certain purpose. You exactly say, why did you pick that hardware and not another hardware in there? But anything that is more cross-cutting, we can capture in chapter nine in very nicely time-sorted uh, architectural decision records. I've brought you two examples here of such uh, design decisions. First of all, the system has to be very quick. And therefore, all the calculations are performed with integers, with fixed point numbers. 
in uh, the C++ application. Only if it's unavoidable, then we're using float in there. So that's a key design decision. Don't use float. Another one was on buffering of the video information, and I don't want to read all the details in this talk to you. So uh, this nearly brings me to the end. If you want to read more about that, the complete example that I've shown you is contained in this book, which is on Lean Pub. You can download that as an ebook, and it's called Arc 42 by Example, Volume 2. Architecture, docu architecture Documentation for Embedded Systems and IoT that I have co-authored with Wolfgang and a third guy, Ivan. Uh, the other example in that book is uh, an IoT system having many, many sensors either in buildings or out there on the landscape and collecting them and they are either cabled or they are cable-less and you're collecting other things. So it's a typical uh, IoT system that we're describing in there. There is another book out there, uh, mainly written by Gernot Stark and some other guys in there, uh, Ralf Müller, that you might have seen on this conference already. Uh, and this is more for commercial examples. Both of them are published on LeanPub in there. There is six real-world examples of architecture documentations in the commercial world. Here is two examples in the embedded world. But you can also go to our websites to learn more about uh, Arc42. You can, if you're reading in English, there's this Lean Pub book from Gannard and me on communicating software architecture, lean, effective, and painless. So we want to make it simple. We don't want to have an overkill of documentation in there. Most of that stuff you can also read on frequently asked questions uh, about that. So you don't even have to buy the book. So let me come to a conclusion. Yes, you really can use Arc42 for embedded hardware software systems. It's not only made for software systems. You can document embedded systems. You can design view-based with these three views, the deployment view, which very often drives the whole architecture, the building block view with the functionality, whether the functionality is uh, software or hardware. Uh, you can use those cross-cutting concepts to ease the overall understanding so that to factor out things that are used in more than one place in there. And you can keep the documentation very small and beautiful. Uh, this system here that I described to you and, uh, contains seven, di seven different hardware processors seven different hardware boards. It contains about 200,000 lines of code in C++. Uh, it was developed uh, in about 20 person month of hardware development and 40 person month of software development. And the documentation is captured in 42 pages. So that's about everything I wanted to tell you. And I thank you very much for listening to that. Remember, Wolfgang did all the work and the design. I just do the talking. Thanks for listening. Peter and Wolfgang, thank you so much for being with us today. And thank you for this great presentation. Um, I was really happy to, to tell you that you agreed to I speak at the Software Architecture Gathering. And um, yeah, we have a question from our audience. Let's take a look. Got one question. We wait at this question. Oh, um, you, you have to close your hopping. We have. Few, um, Problem with the noise, Peter. Okay. Uh, first question. Look, you have presented uh, well engineered. Got one question. We okay. made this question. Uh, um, your experience with prototyping, you, you have to close incremental your development in this project. How did documentation evolve? Well, well, 
we did very much of, of uh, prototyping and incremental development. Uh, it was this system was developed in three versions uh, over several years. So we we just added so the sum so of of the whole uh, work uh, when we calculated the whole time. Um, and uh, everything had to be tested out. We calibrate this uh, system by GPS. We did that, uh, that at a time where GPS still had uh, jitter and was not very precise. And uh, the first prototype I built, I said, oh, that does not work. Yes, I had deviations about 40% the whole time. I said, this, this would never work out. Then I refined some algorithms, and then it worked so precisely that the chief of the Swiss authority said, why do you calibrate this thing uh, along a, a distance of four kilometers? I re uh, reset it and drive out of our parking lot, and you have calibrated in the precise range of one uh, tenth of percent. Yes, so uh, very much of, of experiment and refinement and the documentation was done afterwards. Yes, so uh, it was it, it developed at, at a time where I did not yet uh, uh, know about uh, UML and all these things. So I did documentation after that when I uh, tried to, uh, when I have started giving courses uh, in, in software architecture and uh, all, I also developed a UML course and in, in that course I studied the whole UML and did diagrams from this uh, system uh, to, uh, yeah the key idea is uh, we don't keep all the old documentation of the wrong uh, designs in there you only keep the documentation of the finalized systems many of the design decisions have been made by experimentation by finding out whether the hardware is quick enough by seeing whether you really can have an algorithm that's efficient enough and if it turned out to not fulfill the quality requirements, you had to refactor, you had to redo all that stuff. And why should we keep all the old document? We have the old documentation, but that's versioned. The, the one that's published is the one like the system really looks like in the end uh, when it's mounted into the police cars. And all the trial and error in between, you can delete from your documentation in order to not have all that stuff confusing with your real current system. 